Good afternoon to the families, teachers, friends, supporters, and what most importantly will be in just a matter of hours, the 2023 graduating class of UCLA School of Arts and Architecture. You've done the homework, you burned the midnight oil, you've passed the exams, and holy crap, you did half of that on Zoom during a once in a century global freaking pandemic, which, which hallelujah, you survived. And now you are here on this campus for one last time wearing no name pizza boxes on your heads. Your professors dress like the cast of Harry Potter as you celebrate all that you've achieved while standing on the precipice of a cliff called the rest of your life on earth. Thank you so much for inviting me, a wee professional performance artist with a bachelor's degree in world arts and cultures who has been incredibly vindicated as of late. I am humbled to be your commencement speaker. I know you probably could have had your pick of any of the contestants from The Bachelorette. You could have maybe had a semi-recognizable actor from some show on Peacock or Freebie or whatever the hell the Criterion channel is. Heck, you could have had James freaking Franco as your commencement Excuse me, sorry. You can Google me and James Franco. There's some inst interesting history there. I'm not going to get into it. Anyway, the point is, you could have had any of them for pennies on the dollar, but you chose to get me. And guess what? Soon to be graduated Bruins. I'm going to tell you how you're going to do it with a liberal arts degree in this moment in history, which is playing out like a really long episode of Black Mirror. I'm gonna tell you how you're gonna save the world as young creatives, mostly because you have no choice but to. Or maybe I'm just gonna give you a glimpse of what a creative life rooted in constant consideration of social justice looks like after college. Because if I, Captain Quirks a lot, could do it, maybe you can too, maybe, I don't know. Nothing's guaranteed, we're gonna try. I'm just gonna try. Can I try? Okay. So let me take you back in time to Saturday, June 17th, 2000, exactly 23 years ago today. I sat exactly where you are right now. I was the first class of Y2K. A few months before graduating, my friend Melissa and I were sitting on the grass in front of Kirkhoff, agonizing about what we were going to do with our degrees in world arts and cultures, which we'd be holding in a matter of months. And out of nowhere, Melissa suggests, hey, what if we become performance artists? Like for a living. Like our professors, Peter Sellers, Tim Miller, Dan Fruit. Now, I didn't even know what performance art was till I got to UCLA. I did not know that art could be political. I had no idea before getting to UCLA that Asian Americans were part of social justice movements. College was a wake up call that the personal was political, that the political could be art and that art could spark social change. And maybe I didn't grasp it that succinctly, but what I did figure out pretty quickly was that when I made performances that were uniquely me, I felt free like liberated free, like I'm actually getting a break from being super depressed and stressed out free. Now, as an undergrad, I frequented this little office on campus called Student Psychological Services. It's now called CAPS. Give it up for Counseling and Psychological Services at UCLA. Let there be no shame in using it. And while talking to a therapist was helpful, I did a better job of expunging my own angst when I birthed it into joyous and sometimes ridiculous performance. And I'd already been thinking for a while, wow, instead of paying a therapist big bucks to listen to me talk about my problems, what if I get an audience to pay me 
to listen to me talk about my problems. Thank you. And by the way, I, I'm not telling you to take an improv class instead of getting professional help. I'm sharing, sharing my experience. And so I tacitly decided that day on the lawn at Kirkhoff with Melissa that I would further defy my parents' desires for me to study something practical like medicine and become a doctor and marry a Chinese doctor and have Chinese doctor babies via immaculate conception because this is how I was taught Chinese people have babies. Um, that I would whole hog pursue life as a performance artist when I graduated from UCLA. While Melissa, who came up with this idea, would instead enroll in law school. But it's not like anyone was looking to employ a 22-year-old Asian American woman with a non-existent portfolio of political, social, justice-oriented performance work. Where would I find the resources to make this performance art? And how would I get audiences to find me and help me sustain my career? And herein also began the idea for my World Arts and Cultures senior project. I would take advantage of the new technology that was the World Wide Web. And I would exploit the, er, the instinct of early dial-up internet users who were using the web to search for porn. And in the year 2000, before there were search engine optimizations, I built a fake mail-order bride website called BigBadChineseMama.com. So if you did a search for male order bride or Asian women on Ask Jeeves or Bing, which were the search engines of note in the year 2000, in the top 10 search results, you would find pornography, mail order bride services, and my fake mail order bride website with its harem of fake mail order brides who would scold you for assuming the soft and submissive stereotype of an Asian woman. Sure. I'll take it. I'll take what I can get. I can take one. Okay. Now, I know that my fake porn site does not sound that revolutionary to you all right now, especially today when there is so much free adult content on the web. Places like Pornhub, X Video, X Hamster, Triple X Bunker, TNX, TNA Flix, Apetude, Metaporn, 88 Gals, Analyze, Punisher Tube. Okay, listen, the point is... The point is, 23 years ago, I leveraged that little, incredibly unsophisticated senior project into a professional art career, slowly. Out of college, I flipped things on eBay to pay my rent. I worked part-time at an arts nonprofit for $10 an hour. I ushered at Highway's performance space to see shows for free, and in the interim, I would find professors all over the country who were teaching BigBadChineseMama.com on their syllabuses, and I would introduce myself to those professors, and if their classes were within driving distance, I would invite myself to speak at their classes about my work for honorariums that ranged from anything from zero to a hundred dollars. Then I would take my new cred as a university speaker, and I would apply for grants and fellowships for emerging artists to further my studies and performance and writing. I'd find free workshops where I could learn to write and make performances. I created small performances which I would then cobble into longer shows and eventually, across the years, I started getting presented by larger entities. In the last two decades, I've also created original theater work with the community of Skid Row, formerly incarcerated APIs, undocumented immigrants, and I've witnessed in these communities what I felt so many years ago on this campus. The transformation that is possible when you perform your truth into existence. I was scrappy, I was shameless, I was resourceful, I was shameless, I was always exhausted and discouraged, but I was shameless, and now I am the first Asian American woman to be named Pulitzer Prize finalist in drama among a hell of a lot of her ceilings that I have broken across a hell of a lot of other accolades. For the last 23 years, it has been an ugly, but also incredible ride, the way life often is. Did I almost quit? Many times. 
But when I thought about moving backwards, I realized quickly there was nothing there for me. So I just dragged one foot in front of the other, always believing that the art that made me feel liberated and heard as a college student could liberate others, could amplify social justice movements and change the world. Now, it feels so naive to describe BigBadChineseMama.com to you in 2023 when we now have artificial intelligence technology that threatens our work as creative thinkers. Automation of creativity is one of the reasons right now that the Writers Guild of America is now on strike. Now, I don't want to totally crap on AI. Your commencement programs, which I conceptually designed, are Mad Libs, in which you co-write a commencement speech with AI. So feel free to work on it during the commencement today when your kid's name is not being called. You can... Anyway, AI is scary. It does have its perks. Uh, thanks to AI journalism bots, I'm reported to be worth anywhere from five to $11 million, a number that my bank still won't recognize. Um, I'm also reportedly married to NBA superstar Jeremy Lin. Go ahead and Google who is Jeremy Lin's wife if you want to understand what I'm talking about. Or not. <laughs> but I am not going to lie, artificial intelligence threatens our value as creatives. It's not going anywhere. And it can only get more advanced. But so you know you are not going anywhere either. And what you have it cannot be replaced by an algorithm. Empathy, flesh, the ability to hope, the risk of bruising. Yes, I know I am not the most technologically savvy person to be telling you that you can be better than AI. I still do not know how to open the doors of a Tesla to save my life. But what you have, what I know you have in your hearts and your impulse to act on it is what this world needs more than anything right now. During the pandemic, I witnessed how systems failed us, how our healthcare system failed communities of color and indigenous communities like the Navajo Nation that were getting hit 10 times harder than their neighboring communities. Capitalism could not save us when there were not even masks to buy on the market in March 2020. Our government failed us with inconsistent COVID protocols and our most powerful elected leaders using racial slurs like China virus, which only exacerbated a rising climate of anti-Asian hate. On March 20, 2020, when California declared shelter in place orders, I found myself like all artists did, a non-essential worker with a canceled tour and no income. I deployed that long lost homesteading skill of sewing which I used to sew my sets and my props, and I made, for the first time, homemade face masks from old bed sheets and elastic that I had cut off my bras. Within hours, I got flooded with requests for masks from nurses and firefighters. These requests grew exponentially, and for the first time as a performance artist, I felt like what it was like to be the difference between life and death for someone else. I said yes to all these requests, no idea how in a country that wasn't prepared for a pandemic, let alone a home sewing movement, where I would find the fabric, the elastic, the time to sew all these masks before this pandemic spread further. I could not outsource, hire, or buy my way out of the situation. It was a moment that needed human intelligence and muscle. So in my search for help, I started what was supposed to be a temporary Facebook sewing group called the Auntie Sewing Squad. I named that group in such a rush, I didn't realize our acronym was ASS. What was supposed to be a two-week stopgap until the government stepped in to distribute masks became a full-blown shadow FEMA that went on for 504 days using the labor of 800 volunteer aunties all sewing remotely Ass got 350,000 home sewn masks to hundreds of thousands uh, to, to, to communities that were already left vulnerable by the pandemic. And we also got hundreds of thousands of dollars in hygiene and medical supplies to communities that had borne the brunt of federal neglect. Yeah. 
As was an unlikely army of aunties armed with sewing machines, and I, their accidental overlord. There are very few opportunities in life when you can exploit the labor of mostly women of color and children and be called a hero. And I found that opportunity. But sweatshop jokes aside, what kept us total strangers going was the absolute generosity that we showed each other while navigating our own losses during COVID. Whether it was an auntie dropping off fresh baked bread for another auntie so they could take a much needed break from sewing and know that they were worthy of care, or aunties from around the country mailing postcard to Auntie Sunny's 80-year-old mother whose dementia was exacerbating because of the increasing isolation. Or Auntie Leilani who cut up her old hula costumes then sewed them into masks for black communities who were getting hit hardest by COVID while they also grieved the murder of George Floyd. Our Auntie Sally, who we lost in July 2021 sewing between rounds of chemotherapy so that low-income families in East Los Angeles could have masks. We created human ways to keep each other alive in our unique community of care. We found a way to stay connected in that moment of extreme isolation. And while I'd never worked in the garment industry before, nor done relief work, I applied what I knew about making community theater projects to leading this group to make every auntie feel like they had a voice and that whatever experience they had, whether it was a little sewing knowledge or the ability to brave the post office, all of it was valuable. AI could not do that. Only humans could do that. Today, some of you are the first in your family to graduate from college. Let me hear you if that's you. Some of you are undocumented and unafraid. Some of you are immigrants who await the opportunity to become US citizens. Some of you got through college working full or part-time jobs. Some of you raised families while you were in school. Some of you came out of the closet during your years in college. And if you were already out of the closet, you really came out in the last few years. Some of you managed unfathomable losses on top of getting your education. Some of you navigated neurodiversity and disabilities. And if you are not the students I named, I hope you were incredible allies to those who were. Robots could not pull off what you have pulled off in your years at UCLA. The grit, the anguish, the courage, the hope, the heart. And so I ask you, graduating class of 2023, as you emerge into the world, what is that radical imagination that you have that no robot or AI can replicate? And how will you lead with that heart, that human intelligence? What is your fake porn site that you're going to open those doors with? What is your ass-like community in which you will realize your full potential for generosity? How are you going to show those AI robots that everything they can do, you can cry, shout, feel, and empathize better? Deploy your human intelligence and human heart every chance you get because we desperately need you. Young, creative human thinkers who bear human intelligence to get this world to a better place. I look so forward to seeing what you do next. I'm so sorry that my generation has left you with the whole climate change thing. And congratulations. UCLA class of 2023.